this is a study of Matthew chapter 26. Um, the main theme of this chapter is sacrifice, and it's uh, getting close to the time of Jesus Christ's uh, crucifixion. So I'll just read through it first. Um, and it came about that when Jesus had finished all these words and said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. Then the chief priests and elders and uh, other people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. Uh, and they were saying, not during a festival, lest a riot occur among the people. Now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, which he poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant uh, when they saw this, and they said, oh, uh, why, why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for the high, uh, high price and money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. Uh, for when she poured this perfume upon my body and did prepare me for burial, truly I say to you, uh, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done uh, shall be also be spoken of in memory of her. And when one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief, uh, well, then one of the twelve uh, named Judas Iscariot <coughs> went to the chief priest and said, "What do you want to give me to deliver him up to you?" And they weighed out to him thirty pieces of silver. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to prepare uh, for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into this city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I am to keep the, uh, the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with twelve disciples, and they were eating. He said, Truly I say to you, one of you will, uh, will betray me. And, be, and, be, and being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Truly it is not I, Lord. And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to, is to go, just as is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would, be, it would, be, it would have been good for that, man, uh, for, for that man if he had not, not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And he said, You have said it yourself. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after, after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat this, uh, eat this in my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from, the, uh, from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the, that day when... I drink it uh, new with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, uh, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter answered and said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this night, for a cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Then Jesus came uh, to them to a place called Gethsemane and said, Disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. 
And he took with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And they were uh, a little beyond, uh, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, praying, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to them, Peter, you, uh, you men could not, uh, said to Peter, you men could not keep watch with me for one hour, keeping watch and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and uh, said to them, Are you still sleeping? And, and taking your rest, behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise and let us be going. Uh, behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he was, uh, now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whoever, whoever I, uh, I kiss, I shall kiss. He is the one, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went to Jesus and said, Hi, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, uh, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of the, those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck, the, and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ears. And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot uh, appeal to my Father, and he will at once put... At his disposal, twelve legions of angels. How then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus uh, said to the multitude, Have you come out uh, with swords and clubs to arrest me as against the robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple uh, teaching you, teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. And those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and elders were gathered together. But Peter also was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death. And they did not find any even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you, not make, uh, do you, not, do you make no answer? What, what, what is it uh, that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you uh, by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ Uh, the Son of God, Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robe, saying, He is blasphemed. What, what for the need we uh, have of, of witness? Behold, you have, have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Uh, then they spat in his face and beat him with their, uh, their fists, and others slapped him. And said, Prophesy to us, uh, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, uh, You too were with Jesus and Gal uh, the Galilean. But he denied it before them, saying, I do not know. What, what are you talking about? And when he was, had gone to the, out to the gateway, and another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man is with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, uh, the bystander came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for the way your, your talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear, I did not know the man. And immediately the cock crowed. And Peter remembered the, Lord, the word which Jesus had said, Before the cock crows, you would deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Okay.
Okay, uh, first two verses. And it came out when that when that uh, that when Jesus had finished all these words, and he, he said to his disciples, "You know that the two that after two days uh, uh, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion." Okay, so he's he's stating outright that he's it's time for him to to be be sacrificed. So recall that in, in chapter 25, the central theme was uh, our responsibilities. Our, our, first, our responsibility to seek and love God with our, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then our responsibility to tend the sheep, which means to teach them the gospel. right? And then our responsibility to shepherd the sheep, which means to take care of you know, the, 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 their whole needs, you know, including earthly needs. right? Uh, but the central theme of this chapter is sacrifice, right? And, you know, Jesus Christ is crucified uh, in the next chapter, but really he makes the decision to, 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 uh, to, to be sacrificed in this chapter. So uh, you can say that he really sacrificed at this point. All right. Uh, so now is the time of Jesus' sacrifice, and he's fully aware of it. He, he, he knew this from, from, you know, from the get-go, from the start, that... He's going to, be, you know, eventually come to this point and be sacrificed, uh, and um, so he, he's fully aware of the horrible suffering and, and pain and humiliation that he's going to have to endure, and you know it, it terrifies him, right? Why does it terrify him? He's Jesus Christ, but why does it terrify him? Because he's fully flesh, like any man's fully flesh. God made him fully flesh so he can experience our weakness, right? So he's cringing at the thought of having to go through this, as would anyone else, right? Uh, uh, you know, even though he's fully God. But yet he doesn't back down because uh, he sacrifices his will in obedience to God, right? You know, you can say, well, one thing, Jesus, Jesus Christ knows that, that God has a bigger plan in mind here and that the purpose of his sacrifice is for the salvation of God. Um, Of all mankind. Okay. All right, now, so Passover is coming. All right. Um, you recall, Passover started in uh, Exodus, you know, when the, the, the Israelites... Uh, were brought out of Egypt, all right, and a number of things had to be done to convince Pharaoh, and you know, he still wasn't convinced. So finally, you know, got to the point where he, you know, God uh, um, destroyed the firstborn Egyptian of every Egyptian family, right, and um, to avoid. You know, for for an Israelite to avoid, you know, their, their firstborn son to be, um, you know, killed, they they had to paint the, the blood of, of a lamb on the doorposts uh, of their house, right? And, and if the blood was there, then you know the angel of death would pass over that house and go, you know, go on to the next one, or whatever, right? So it represented um, sparing a life, salvation. So it's appropriate that Christ's crucifixion occurs at Passover, which was a time when lambs were sacrificed and their blood poured over over, over doorposts so that the Lord would pass over the home and spare the firstborn, right? Not not take the life of it. Uh, Passover was also the time of Yom Kippur that became the, you know, and it still is, you know, a, a Jewish tradition, a holiday, and and it was a practice in which, uh, uh, well, Yom Kippur uh, uh, transla is translated to mean Day of Atonement. And it's a day when, when uh, the high priest and only the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies, right? So the Holy of Holies is a, a chamber here, and it's separated by a veil, right? And no one can go in, right? It's, it's where the presence of God made, made himself present. And no one could go in except for the high priest and only on one day a year, which is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and only with the blood sacrifice, which he pours over on top of the mercy seat, Mercy seat is the cover of the uh, Ark of the Covenant, okay, which contained the Ten Tablets. I mean, the, the, the t Tablets of the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, okay, so what's interesting is um, 
All right. The, 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 the word for mercy seat is hilasterion, right? Which is uh, very, it's, it's related, almost identical to the word for propitiation. So this word can be translated propitiation also, but it's mercy seat. Uh, it's formally mercy seat, and uh, it's related to the word propitiation, uh, the, the actual uh, biblical Greek words, hilasterion and hilaskome, right, uh, were related. Propitiation was, as you recall, the payment made in lieu of punishment, right, uh, to pay for our sins so that we can have atonement. Right? That's the idea why the high priest uh, went, in, went in there once a year. They sacrificed the blood, which represented the life of the flesh, right, uh, in order to, to, to avoid God's punishment, to get atonement with God, which means at one minute. All right, uh, so yeah, you know, you know, we all sin. Everyone sins. Right, and if God's to be righteous, and sin is violation of God's will, sin is violation of God's law, right? And if God is to be righteous, then He has to apply the proper punishment for violating the law, right? So sin requires punishment, and that punishment is separation from God. I mean, that's the worst punishment as you get, which is damnation, which is you know you could say it's hell, you know, uh, uh, a place where you're separated from God, where there's only fear, there's not the goodness of the Spirit. Um, all right, and so we, you know, because of this, we all need salvation, which is represented by the Passover, and, and therefore we need a propitiatory sacrifice, which is the payment made in lieu of our punishment. And this was performed once a year at Yom Kippur at, at the time of Passover. Only the high priest, uh, uh, like we said, could enter into the Holy of Holies, and he, he sprinkled the blood of the sacrificed lamb upon the mercy seat. All right, so the idea here is that, you know, G this is time of Jesus' sacrifice, right? Uh, and he was the perfect lamb without blemish. That's, you know, that's what he said, get a lamb without blemish in Exodus 12, 5. And he, he was a perfect lamb in that he, even though he was made to be sin and to be sacrificed, to be hung on, to hung on a tree, right? Uh, he knew no sin. He did not, he did not sin, right? That's 2 Corinthians. Uh, so Jesus was a perfect sacrifice once and for all. And this is from Hebrews 10.10. 10. By this we have uh, been sac uh, sanctified uh, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. right? And you can say that just as God provided Abraham the lamb you know, uh, as a sacrifice in lieu of you know, sacrificing his son Isaac, right? so also did he provide his one and only son to be sacrificed for our, our salvation. So God, God demands that we be punished right? because he's righteous. Right, he's not. He, he's going to do what's just and righteous. He's going to follow the law, right? But he makes a legal provision, and uh, he sacrifices his one and only son for our salvation. All right. So, uh, okay. Now, so this is about the chief priests, and, and and you know they're they're plotting to kill Jesus. All right. So they're 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 getting together and you know in this secret cabal right and they're wh like whispers in the dark here and they're they're planning. I mean they want to they want to kill Jesus right, but they got to do it quietly. Why? Because they're afraid. Because they're cowards. It's not about doing what is right, right? It's not about having the courage to stand up and and and, and do what's right. As a what what they're about is you know what most people are about what is best for them, right? Um, and uh, so they're doing what's best for them, you know, and they know th there's a threat to them because Jesus has followers. So they don't want to do it to the festival because they don't want to have a riot, you know. This would be a great opportunity for a riot to occur and, then, you know, a blowback on them. So from the high priest on down, the Jewish leaders were not upright men. They were sneaky cowards who wanted to murder, but by stealth, fearing for their lives, fearing for themselves. They were not courageously doing what was right. They were cowardly doing what was wrong. Uh, and then, you, you know, when they, when they actually killed Jesus, they did the same thing. They didn't, you know, they, they were fearing, just like they feared the disciples of, and the followers of, of uh, John the Baptist, so also they feared the, the followers of Jesus Christ. You know, the, the ramifications they may face, right? The, the, the violence they may face. They're afraid of that, right? They anticipate that. So they don't kill Jesus Christ themselves. They get the Romans to do it, 
right? But it was fully them behind it. Uh, and we'll see that in, in the next chapter, how they wormed their way into ensuring that uh, Jesus Christ was killed. But that was all God's will. I mean, they think they're doing their will. They, they were following their will, their wicked will. But um, what, 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 what they meant for evil, God meant for good. I mean, that's what it says in Genesis. When um, That's what uh, Joseph said, actually, to his brothers. Hey, you know, you guys threw me into the pit, you know, and so forth, right? You know? But, but you know what? Don't worry about it because what you meant for evil, God meant for good, for the saving of many souls, right? And that's exactly what, what Jesus Christ was all about. What, what the, Jew, the, the Jewish leaders meant for evil, God meant for good, for the salvation of many people, to provide that salvation to the whole world, you know, if, if they want to accept it. And the thing about it is there's no cost to it, right? There's no price you got to pay for it. You just have to believe. Oh, uh, now when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, and she poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant uh, when they saw this and said, Why this waste? Uh, for this perfume might have been sold for a high price and, and, and money given to the poor. And, but Jesus said to them, Well, why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have her, but uh, you, you do not always have me. For when she poured this perfume upon me, she did prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you that uh, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done uh, shall be spoken in memory of her. Okay, so, uh, you know, it says, Jesus says here, prepare me for burial. And the practice back then was to, uh, you know, before a, a body's buried, after a person dies, they know it's going to rot and stink bad, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be bloated, you know, with bacteria, and it's going to be horrible smelling. So they would prepare the body with, you know, uh, different herbs and so forth and pleasant smelling things to try to like cover it up. Um, uh, so that was a practice. But you know what I think this is more about is, uh, so it's preparation for burial, but I think it was preparation for sacrifice. All right. Because if you look up the, the uh, biblical Greek words for incense and aroma, uh, right, both these words here, right, each of them have a meaning of a, a, a fragrant or aromatic offering to God. You know, for example, when, when uh, they would sap, make the blood sacrifice, right? They would burn the carcass uh, outside. I think, I'm not sure exactly where it was, whether there's an outer court or, you know, it was outside the temple, in, outside the temple. And they would, but they would burn uh, the, the carcass, right? And as a savory offering, so that the you know the scent of uh, uh, the meat, you know charred meat, would, 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 would the aromatic scent would, would would waft up to God as a pleasing scent of sacrifice. And really, the best pleasing scent of sacrifice are our prayers, right? When we pray to Him, when we pour out love to Him. That's really our sacrifice. That's the pleasant aroma. That's a pleasant scent, right? That 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 uh, um, gives God joy. You know, and which is something that we, sh we, we, we should want to do, right? We should want to give God joy, right? Instead of, like, just asking for God for stuff. Um, anyways, uh, so, yeah, I see this as really more preparation for a sacrifice than preparation for burial, right? And he's going to be sacrificed here pretty soon, right? Uh, okay. And, you know, you can say that, you know, God, that... that, that that uh, it, it's horrible to God that his son's going to be sacrificed, ki tortured, and killed in a brutal way. But at the same time, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing for him because it's a will that's willing to sacrifice itself right, for the salvation of many people and for, and, and for obedience to God. Right? And the quality, the quality that, of a heart that can do that, uh, it, you know, it gives God joy that... that you know, the person can get overcome himself that much. Um, anyways, uh, so as for Christ, uh, did I cover everything I want here? Uh, okay, so as far as Christ's comment about the poor here, um, this, is what I th this is what I think he meant. His sacrifice is a once and for all thing. Right? We said that from Hebrews 10, right? A perfect sacrifice once and for all. Right for the salvation of all mankind. So th this is this is of great importance, a lot more importance than just some money, right? 
And, and you know, the, the chief person complaining here was actually Judas. I think that's in the book of John. It was one of the other books, one of the Gospels, right, where it says specifically that, that you know, Judas Iscariot was the one to complain, right? And uh, it was because he was he carried the money back, and he, he, was, he was, you know, um, uh, pilfering money out of the money bag. So he figured, man, I can, I can you know, make some cash for myself here uh, if, if, you know, if we sold this instead. Anyways, uh, so, uh, yeah, one is, you know, his sacrifice is far more important than just a little bit extra money for the poor, which may help them for a time. Um, but another is, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, right? You know, yeah, poor, poor can be with you, right? That's okay. It's okay. In fact, it's okay that the poor, right? Because material wealth means nothing compared to your eternal spiritual state. This is what's all important. This is what, this is what lasts forever. Your life here in this world, you know, is a flash in the pan, you know, compared to eternity. But what we do here matters, right? Because that has impact upon uh, what happens to us in eternity. All right, uh, Jesus always de-emphasized the material, right? He always did. He always said, don't worry about the stuff of the world, right? Don't seek after the stuff of the world, you know? Don't, don't worship mammon. You can only serve one or the other, right? Forget about mammon. And you place supreme importance upon the spiritual. So this doesn't mean that Jesus was, Jesus was insensitive to the needs of the poor, you know? For he spoke of that repeatedly. He was all saying, you know what? You know, you got you, you got to shelter the poor. You know, you give them a drink of water. You know, uh, you know, you feed them, whatever. You know, take care of their needs, right? Food, shelter, water, shelter, clothing, caring, right? Have caring for people. They, you know, uh, 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 but anything above that is really just luxury, right? And man's pursuit of luxury is one of the chief distractions from our focus on God. I mean, people know that is right. Pursuing luxury, right? Pursuing stuff. The other thing is, you know, the, the, I think the big thing is our vanity, our self. You know, uh, you know, what we try to protect, you know, in, in, in society, right? And other people. In fact, we call them asps. If you have people who are attacking you always, right? It's so easy to fall into the trap of focusing upon them, looking down upon the the poisonous snake that are biting you instead of looking up to Jesus Christ. This is a big a big downfall, but it's also a big challenge. It's a big it's a big opportunity, right? You know, to overcome ourselves. Uh, which is not easy which is easy to say, you know. It's it's not easy to do. Um okay. Then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what do you want to give me to deliver him up to you? And they weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. All right? First of all, this is, a clear, this is straight up blood money. Right? And the Pharisees fully understood this, as you'll see in the next chapter. Yeah, they knew, right, they knew immediately that this is blood money. They're like, eh, right? All right? So, but this is, this is also a fulfillment of Zechariah 11, uh, verses 12 through 14, where it says, And I, Zechariah, and I, Zechariah said to them, uh, If it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if, if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which uh, I was valued by them. All right. Oh yeah, God's worth thirty shekels of silver for the. You know, that's as much as you're worth to these people. So I took the, the thirty shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Then I cut my staff, union in pieces, to break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And that did happen. You know, Judah and Israel separated. Um, third, the Pharisees would retake this money. Oh yeah. So in the next chapter, you know. Uh, Judas is all, you know, he gets a little bout of conscience, right? So he goes back and says, hey, take the money back. He throws it into the temple, right? And then the Pharisees are like, oh, no, 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 no. We can't have that money in here because that's blood. That's corrupt money. That's blood money, right? We got to get rid of it somehow. Well, who made it corrupt blood money? They did. They're the ones who, who, who took that money and paid for, you know, the blood of Jesus Christ. So, you know, they're like, oh, we can't have that money. Well, you made it that way. Uh... Okay, and they use that money instead to purchase the potter's field. Okay, so the key thing with the potter's field, I mean, you know, was that, that 
you know, in the yard, the potter obviously makes pots out of clay. And he, he uses the kiln to fire them, make it hard, whatever, right, and paints them, whatever, whatever he does, right. But it, it, you know, not not every pot is, is without flaw, and those that are defective, right, he just tossed into his yard. So the potter's field was full of broken shards of broken pottery, right. Um, okay, littered with broken shards of earthenware, which I believe symbolizes people who are broken vessels that cannot hold God's spirit, right? So I, th I believe this is symbolic, right? Um, so the broken vessels that cannot hold spirit, similar to the people who practice craftiness that Paul talked of in, in 1 Corinthians 3, who he said destroy, who destroy themselves as a temple for God, right? Making themselves unfit for you know, uh, to have the Holy Spirit because they do wicked things. They practice craftiness. Anything sneaky, anything underhanded, you know, from the little things to the big things. You know, even even the simple lie is craftiness. What did Jesus Christ say? He said it was not yay, yay, or nay, nay. You know, it's not straight forward. But right? if you have any subtlety in there, even the slightest extent, he said it comes from evil, right? And he said all liars are children of the devil. Um... Uh, so I know, I, I know that this may seem a, st a stretch, right? This whole thing. Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I believe there's there, there's spiritual meaning here. Can I prove it? No, right? I believe that you know this has to do with the idea of you know that we cannot do wicked things or we break ourselves as vessels uh, for God's spirit. And I know I, I do this myself, right? When I uh, do something fleshly, like uh, if I if I you know, look at pornography or something like that, right? I know that I become more fleshly after that. I know that I'm destroying myself as a temple for God, right? But yet I'll do it. Why? Because I'm weak. I, you know, I'm made of flesh and I'm, you know, I'm tempted and I give into it, right? Uh, I'm not walking in the spirit. You know, I'm not at that point anymore, uh, which I was actually only at that point for a very short time. Um... So, you know, I know this, this sounds like a stretch, but accept it if you want, you know, if you think it's meaningful. But if not, eh, you can reject it out. You know, it's all right. Uh, it also reminds me, for some reason, this reminds me of the, 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 the tale of Humpty Dumpty, right? You know, broken. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put them back together again, right? Uh, we, we break ourselves as a vessels for God. Um, it's our responsibility. All right. On the first day of unleavened bread, um, disciples came to Jesus saying, what do you want us to prepare for, the, for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city at a certain man's house and say, the teacher says, the time's at hand. I'm going to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did. Jesus had directed them. They prepared the Passover. So the Passover meal was actually uh, something that was commanded in, in, in the law. Uh, I forget where that was. Maybe Exodus. Anyways, it, it was in it was in the Nomos uh, Mosaic Law, and it was to commemorate their, their leaving of uh, Egypt, right? Unleavened bread. Uh, uh, leaven in the Old Testament didn't didn't have symbolic meaning. You know, it was just it was just literal. You know. Uh, without without the, 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 the mold, yeast, or whatever, right? Uh, and, you know, unleavened probably because they're, they're, they, they didn't have time or they didn't have the leaven itself, right? They had to just make it on the run here. Uh, but by the time of Jesus Christ, of course, we know that now leaven had, had figurative meaning and it meant uh, primarily something, anything corrupt, especially the corrupt teaching of the Pharisees and scribes. All right, but that's all I'm going to say of this. All right, uh, now when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with 12 disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you would betray me. And he, he began, uh, in being deeply grieved, they each one began to say, Oh, surely not I, Lord. And he answered and said, He who dipped the hand, uh, his hand with me in a bowl is the one who will betray me. But anyways, I read this already. So Judas, he, uh, he comes along and says, and Judas was, uh, was betraying him answer. Sure, it's not I, Rabbi. Well, he just got, he just finished getting the money. 
to do it, right? So he, he's being a liar, you know. Um, and Jesus calls him out and says, yeah, you said it yourself, right? Oh, you know, I wanted to mention something up here. Uh, oh, no. Okay, I'm good, okay. Uh, all right. Okay, all this stuff. Uh, all right, so this is, I, I think this part is really the core of this chapter, in, in, in my view anyways. Uh, okay, uh, verse 26 through 28, or 29. Okay, and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which I poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it, uh, uh, drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay. All right. Um, so, I'll, I'll, well, I'll, I'll just tell you what I think this means right, right at the very end. So when, when he drinks it anew with you is when he's sharing it with you. Right in my Father's kingdom, and is and, and and Christ's kingdom is a kingdom of God, the Basilica, as it is, as it exists, you know, as he as God resides within our hearts, right? So this is when you drink it again, uh, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so this fruit. Uh, the fruit there is, uh, ooh, what is that fruit? I think it's genema. Yeah, genema. Okay, that's right. Uh, pr uh, produce, harvest, right? Uh, fruits of righteousness. Okay. Which is also related to, you know, giving life. Uh, 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 what is it? What is it? Um, born, born. Uh, born has, is... Very closely related to, to Genema, right? So born again, you know, uh, is very related to having the fruits. Anyways, um, I believe this passage can be interpreted in several ways. One, transubstantiation, big fancy term, man-made term there. Uh, it can also commemorate Christ's sacrifice. You know, he's commemorating this, you know, I'm going to sacrifice for you, right? I'm going to sacrifice my body. I'm going to sacrifice my soul, my, my, my blood, which is the life of the flesh, right? Uh... It's also a call for us to sacrifice, but I also think, I believe this is a fulfillment of the Old Covenant by ushering the New Covenant. So, you know, a lot of people understand this, recognize this as Jesus Christ establishing the New Covenant. Um, you know, and that's said in Hebrews, for example. Is it Hebrews? Um, yeah, I know, I know. you know, it, it's said in the New Testament uh, places that this is, this is the New Covenant that has been established, right? So... Um, uh, let's talk about each one of these. First is transubstantiation. Yeah, I, I don't believe this at all. You know, uh, transubstantiation is the idea that the prayer of a priest, a man, a carnal, you know, physical man, can somehow convert the communion cracker and, and you know, grape juice, right, the Eucharist stuff, right, into the real flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, you know, it still looks like it, right, but it's re in reality, it's, you know, this is actually Christ's body. This is actually, you know, Jesus' blood, right? Uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, that's that's simply carnalizing scripture, right? That's taking what is meant to have spiritual meaning and making it literal and physical, right? Uh, we talked about that early on. How you know you, you cannot, you should not do that. In all things, Jesus did. He pointed away from the physical, right? He pointed away from this world because we're locked in this world. Our eyes are, you know, we see this world, right? So this is what we swim in. This is what we live in. We breathe this stuff, right? But he said, listen, you get the real world. The real world is uh, the spiritual world. you got to focus on that. And you can't see that. It takes faith, right? So he did everything he can to get us to focus on that and focus off of the, phys the, the literal world, right? And everything he did and said, Jesus shifted focus off the material physical world and onto the spiritual, right? And he, and he wanted to point that out as our ultimate goal. And he tried to, in so many ways, you know, paint a portrait of what it's like. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God, heaven is like, you know, so forth, right? Um, 
Now, it's a devil that does the exact opposite of Jesus Christ, right? Shifting focus off of God and onto the spiritual world, right? Onto the literal physical world, right? Oh, yeah, focus on this, right? You know, make this your goal, right? And who, who is the devil? The devil, the devil is, is the prince of the air. He's the, the, the ruler of this world. And that's what the Bible says. I believe, I believe that Jesus said here, oh, I believe what Jesus said here can, can um, be taken to represent his sacrifice of body and soul, blood, right? The life of the flesh, to pay for our sins so that we might have atonement with God and be filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit which came 50 days after Christ's resurrection at Pentecost. So this, he made this possible, right? That we can have access to the Holy Spirit. Right? Contingent upon our loving God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. Right? Um, uh, 50 days after Christ's resurrection at Pentecost. Blood of the covenant. So the term blood of the covenant comes out of, uh, where does that come out of? It comes out of, comes out of Genesis or, or uh, it goes back. Genesis or Exodus. Blood of the covenant. Uh, let me look it up real quick. Okay, nine Bible verses. Oh, there's a lot there. Zechariah, Zechariah is one. Old Testament. Oh, Genesis. Yeah, this is Genesis. Blood covenant. Uh, Genesis. Uh, I have to look it up make sure that's right. Uh, Exodus. Yeah, I believe there was an Exodus. Yeah, Exodus. Okay, anyways, it's in the Old Testament, the term blood covenant. Blood of the covenant. Um. All right, uh, I believe this can also be taken as a call for us to sacrifice as well, right? And what did Jesus Christ say? We got to sacrifice. He said, you have to deny the self, pick up your cross daily, and follow me, right? Now, we're not going to die on a cross literally every single day, right? So what he's saying is we have to deny ourselves. Our, our, our cross, our crucifixion is denying ourselves. We're not going to hang on a cross with our you know, hands nailed to the wood and so forth like Jesus Christ, right? But our part is to deny ourselves. Uh, the self being the source of all sin, the self being the, the source of all our nasty fleshliness, right? Uh, so now the best way to do this is by keeping our eyes focused upon Jesus and loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So the effort to deny the self can actually draw focus upon the self. You know, like the Eastern mystics, whatever, right? You know, oh, I'm going to become selfless for, my, for the sake of myself, to prove myself and become selfless. Well, you're just focused on yourself. The best way to overcome the self, to deny the self, right, is to look up to Christ on the cross. Just like the best way to overcome people who are, are biting at your, you know, poisonous snakes biting at your ankles, right, is to look up at Christ on the cross. Right? Keep your eyes focused on Him, right? And pour out your love to Him. Right? So to the extent our focus is on Christ on the cross, our self diminishes. To the extent we're filled with the Holy Spirit, to the extent we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strengths, and He fills us with the Holy Spirit, our self melts away, and we become less conscious of the self when abiding with Him. And I'm, you know, looking, kind of recalling back. I mean, I'm 55 years old, and, and the, point, the, the time when I walked in the Spirit was probably when I was about 21 or 22. Uh, 21 actually. I don't think I was 20. Uh, or maybe I was 20. Oh, I was 22. Yeah, I was 22. Right. I mean, that, and this is for a, sh a short few months, right? But I still kind of remember it. And you are childlike because you're free. You're free from self-consciousness, right? You do things, right, without focus on yourself, right? And you do things abiding in the spirit. And there's there's less, you know, constraint on you, right? And and, and you don't have to try to be good. He makes it easy. He helps you. Um. Anyways, uh, so yeah, yourself kind of melts away when you're walking in the spirit. Um. I believe this can represent the fulfillment of the old covenant of the flesh with the establishment of the new covenant of the blood. So, you know, I think it says in the Bible that the, old, the new covenant does away with the old covenant, right? Well, you know, Jesus also said that he didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have right here. Uh, 
Recall Jesus said, do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So in a sense, the new covenant is replacing the old covenant, but it's not really abolishing it. It's not doing away with it, right? It's just perfecting it, right? Fulfilling it. Uh, so this is also the fulfillment of Meth Messianic prophecies concerning God's promises, right? So I have here a, a bunch of me Messianic prophecies. Here are God's promises of what he's going to do for us, right? Here's our Messianic prophecies that identify Jesus as the Christ, okay? All the things that, you know, the checklist here, you know, you go down these, right? These are really less important. What's important, I believe, to me are these here, right? What is, what is this new covenant all about, you know? In terms for us, right? You know, how, how God is going to help us. So the new covenant is ushered in by the Messiah of Christ, right? Right? Uh, which means anointed one, right? And, and what, which came to mean, you know, son of David, you know, but also son of God, right? Uh, and, and what's involved is a pouring out, God's promise to pour out his spirit in abundance upon the people, Right, uh, is promised to change the hearts, our hearts, from hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Right, and is promised to write His law upon our hearts, teaching us all things good. Right, uh, and bringing them all to our remembrance. We'll see that you know this is part, part of John chapter fourteen, uh, uh, helping us obey the law, uh, walking in God's statutes. Well, why, well, how does He help us do that by writing His law upon our hearts? Right, making it easy. Right, Having, giving us the helper, the legal counselor, you know, the expert in the law, who is God's will, helps us, you know, follow His will because His will is within us. His spirit was, is within us, helping us, guiding us, grafting into the vine. The, you know, the, the perfect goodness of God's eternal life flows through the vine. Right, yielding fruits of the spirit. You know, fruits of the spirit mean you know peace, patience, joy, long suffering, all that stuff. Right, goodness, kindness. Uh, okay, so I believe this is what it's about. When I, when I drink it anew with you, when we are tapped into the vine, when we have, you know, the, the, you know, the goodness of God's life flowing through, through, through us, right? That's when he'll share it again with us, you know, when we're part of God's kingdom. Why? When God's kingdom resides in our hearts, when the Holy Spirit abides in our hearts that's that establishes god's you know legal claim on our hearts okay so let's talk about the old covenant you know the covenant of the flesh all right uh old covenant was made with abraham you know you read genesis i think in genesis chapter 17 where, where um uh, god made a covenant with abraham and the covenant was was great i mean it said yeah you know, um, well, he tells he tells he tells Abraham. I think I mentioned this before. He tells, "Oh, leave your country, leave your kin, leave leave um, uh, your family. You know, put your family behind, right, right, and go to this place uh, where I tell you, and then uh, uh, through you, all 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 the all peoples will be blessed, right." And that was a promise of Jesus Christ. Uh, eventually coming, right? Now, the Old Covenant was contingent upon circumcision of foreskins, right? So, circumcision of foreskin, cutting away the flesh, really what it meant was cutting away the fleshly nature. And for a man, I mean, you know, women, I'm, I'm sure also, but for a man, you know, a, a big part of the fleshly nature is in, you know, uh, their sexual appetite, right? And it's hard to control, right? Uh... Uh, so the old covenant of the flesh, but it's more than that, far more than that. So the old covenant of the flesh was contingent upon our ability to suppress our fleshliness, right? So, you know, foreskin represents only one aspect of fleshliness and really a smaller aspect and probably an aspect which is less important compared to some of the other things. For example, uh, this is from Galatians, uh, you know, describing what the flesh is. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, Okay, that could be, you know, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, okay, yeah, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, okay, so that's a short list. I think there's things far worse than that. This list also includes anything done to harm another person. When you harm another person, that's far worse, I believe, than, you know, when you intentionally harm another person, uh, 
you know, whether it's physical, financial, emotional, abuse, you know, psychological, right, social, uh, lying, you know. What Jesus Christ said that's you're, ch you're a child of the devil. Um, bearing false witness. Now, that's, even, that's a worse form of lying because you're trying to harm a person through a lie. You make a lie, which is wrong, to harm a person. <laughs> All right, so it's like a double thing here. Uh, theft, cheating, you know, and people do this, <laughs> like, without giving a, without batting an eye. You know, and then they'll walk away. I'm a good person. I don't do that. You know, they'll, they'll do it without, you know, no sweat off their brow. Um, cheating, malicious gossip, manipulation, devious game, playing. You know, there's some people who know some clever, devious games. Um, they know, there's people who know clever me methods of manipulating perception. Uh, playing people. Uh, using crafty devices. Remember what Paul said? Wisdom of this world. This is all wisdom of this world right here. Manipulation, devious games, playing craft, you know, crafty devices. Right? That's wisdom of this world. And Paul says that's what destroys the temple. You destroy your own, yourself as a temple of God. When you when you when when you practice those things, now, you think you're smart. Well, you're just a sucker because, you know, um, what does it say? You know, Paul says, what is it? What does the scripture say? God will take those people within their own devices, right? Maybe not in this world, but you know, they they, they do that. You know, long term, right? They suffer the consequences, you know, for eternity. Um, the flesh. So the flesh is all the na natural nastiness within people. We're born with this capacity, all of us, right? We're born with full capacity to be, you know, selfish, envious, jealous, right? You don't have to teach us that, right? That's within our, that's within us. Um, okay, so now the covenant was based upon obedience to the law, right? Uh, by the time of Moses, right? Obedience was the basis of the covenant of the flesh. Here's, uh, I mean, there's plenty of... Uh, passages on this. I'll just give you a sample here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you, you on eagle's wings and brought you up, brought you to myself. This is God speaking to the Israelites you know, through Moses. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, his covenant was based upon his law, then you shall be my, uh, my own possession among the people, for all the earth is mine. Okay, all right, okay. A uh, specific basis of obedience to the covenant was a law, starting with the Ten Commandments. So, obeying the law, right, was the basis of the covenant. So the the keep the keeping of the covenant was contingent upon people obeying the law, right. And obeying the law was all about suppressing their fleshliness, right. They covered the neighbor's wife, or they they covered the neighbor's property, or whatever, you know. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant." So it's based upon these words. In accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. Right? So he was, uh, okay, wait. Uh, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Horeb, right? Uh, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So those are the words of the covenant, right? The law. So, again, the old covenant of flesh is based upon obedience to the law. The stone tablets of the Ten Commandments were called the tablets of the covenant. When I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. So the tablets of stone, the tablets of the Ten Commandments are called the tablets of the covenant. The covenant, the covenant was based upon keeping the law. right? And the, 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 the stone tablets were, were uh, kept within what's called the Ark of the Covenant. Right? So the covenant was based upon the law and keeping of the law. Right? That's where the tablets were, were, uh, were kept, and that's where the, ta the tablets were the covenant. Right? Um, which the Lord had made with you, then I remained on the mount 40 days. Okay, now they ate bread nor drank water. Okay. All right. So that's the key thing there. Now, uh, this, requir this, this requires... Our, our efforts. This requires effort as a young man. Remember we talked about, you know, uh, three levels of Christian uh, maturity. You know, if, if you just simply believe, right, well, you're, you're heir to the kingdom. God said that was, that was condition enough, right? You're not going to go to hell if you believe in Jesus Christ, right? But he didn't want you to just to be there because as just a simple believer, you can be a, ch you can be a child, technot, in the sense of, 
that you sin all the time. Your, your sins have been forgiven you. Blessed are you children because your sins are forgiven you. Right? Blessed are you young men because you, 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 you study the word, you know the word, and you strive against the evil one. And who's the real evil one? Right? Well, we can say the devil, but you know what? It's within our, our own selves. Right? Everyone has that. It's right at our doorstep that we want to do this or that, right? And uh, uh, the, the, the young men are the ones who, 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 who make the willful effort, you know. Uh, now, where, where am I? Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm there sometimes, I'm, but I'm, I'm a child a lot of time. Am I, am I a father, you know, walking in the spirit? No, right? I only tasted that for a brief period of time. Uh, Okay, all right, uh, so now the new covenant, the covenant of blood, right? Life, blood is the life of the flesh, and the true life of the flesh is the Holy Spirit. So this is, this is what Jesus Christ came to bring us. This is the new covenant, right? That uh, we, we, well, uh, so I want, I want to give, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start with giving three of the many Messianic prophecies of God's promises. All right. So we talked about, you know, some of the promises up here, Messianic promise concerning God's promises, what he's going to do, right? These are what are important. These things, I mean, if you want to, you know, are just like substantiation that Jesus is the Christ, right? But really for me, these are the important prophecies, right? Because these show what, what, what potential benefit we may have, right? And it has nothing to do with anything in the world. It has to do with our spirit, right? Our eternal benefit. And, you know, our benefit here now as far as uh, obedience to God. All right, so here are three of the three prophecies, right? It will come upon about the, after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. So this is one of the, the prophecies where uh, God says he's, he's promising he's going to pour out his spirit in abundance upon the children of Israel, right? Uh, here's another one. Well, that's Joel. Um, here's another one. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you, right? He's going to give us a new spirit. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, all right? Okay, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So that's what this is all about. But he's going to help us. Here he's saying he's going to help you. I'll give you my spirit and I'll help you obey my, my, my statutes, all right? I mean, you, 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 did, did anyone succeed here? No, everyone failed. We all fail here. We all sin, right? You know, this is imperfect. The, the old covenant was imperfect. The old covenant failed, right? Because why? Because no one could keep all the, you know, the law, right? Everyone was driven by the flesh, by their selves. So that's why, you know, Jesus Christ said, okay, you know, the, you know Paul said, the law is good. But you know what? The law, the law is, is very much imperfect, right? You know, uh, as far as his ability to, to get us to really obey the law. But this is the covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I'll put my law within them and write it on their hearts. And on their hearts I will write it. And I'll be their God and they should be my people. So, yeah, there's what he's saying. So there's a number of, there's other many other cases where he's saying these same things, right? I have 37 I found in the Old Testament. Um, so these are the messianic prophecies as far as what God promises, right? Uh, okay. Um, so um, um, here's some scripture. Is, in terms of the helper, Paracletos, legal counselor, Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see, where does it say? Oh, yeah, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. So here, the, help, the Holy Spirit, the helper is clearly identified as the Holy Spirit. But we'll, we'll start here. I will, okay. This is John chapter 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth. And what is God? It says in John chapter 8, Jesus says, God is spirit and God is truth. Right? This is God himself. This is God, you know, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive because he does not see him or know him. 
Uh, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. That's the idea, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, abide through the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode within him. So the only place that I know of in, a, in the whole Bible where uh, it's specifically stated, in this case by Jesus Christ, of how and why God will make our abode within you, it's if you love him, right? Keep his word. Now, what was Jesus Christ's key word? What was his key commandment? What did he say was the greatest commandment? To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It came down to that. All right? You know? Uh, okay. So, to, to seek and love God. All right? Paracletos. Uh, oh, okay. That's the word for helper. Paracletos, which means legal counselor. It means advisor, but, you know, it also means legal counselor. Um Write, write law on he writes the law on your heart. So the, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Okay, so you know Jesus is saying, well, you know he's going to teach you all that he'll teach you all things and he'll help you remember. I mean, you can study your, the Bible for years, your whole life, right? And you can mess up because why? You know, certain laws, certain things in the Bible doesn't come directly to your head, right? It's way back in your memory somewhere, and, and, and so you violate it, right? Even if you're a young man trying, okay? But what, what, what this is really saying is he helps you to be good. He gives you, you know, it's more than just teaching you all things and, and bringing all things to remembrance. He makes it you, right? His, he makes you good. He helps, he changes your uh, just your whole spirit, right? You, there's a goodness about you which you didn't have before, right? And you know that's not of you, right? It's not a, 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 a goodness that's of this world. He's helping you to be good. And he'll change your desires. He'll change your motives. He'll change whatever, right? And you'll see things pure. You know, it says in the Bible somewhere that to the pure, all things are pure. And you know what the pure are? The pure are those who have the Spirit of God. Right, who have the Holy Spirit. All things are pure. Right? And it reminds me of what Oswald Chambers says. He says, you know what? You know, a lot of people think that, you know, when you become saved, whatever, and become filled with the Holy Spirit, that you know, it's like like standing on the 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 the, 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 the narrow pinnacle of a mountain, right? Where there's just like one point and you can't move anywhere because you you know you can't do anything, right? But he said, No. It's the opposite. When you get there, you realize it's a big, vast plateau, a big vista where everything is pure to those who are pure, right? And why? Because you don't want anything that's not pure. It's just he changes you, right? All things that you desire are just naturally the good things, right? You don't desire anything nasty, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was myself still then, but man, he just helps you to be good. Um, Okay. Uh, okay. So the Holy Spirit abiding you are the fruit. You know, you get the fruits. Okay. So this is John chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruits, can bear fruit of itself unless it abides in a vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears f much fruit. Right? For apart from me, you, are, you can do nothing. So, uh, you know, the deeds of the flesh are one thing, but the opposite are the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are the good things, right? That's in Galatians. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't write that down. Okay. I just had the bad things here. But right after that, you know, it talks about the good things, patience, peace, joy, love, kindness, charity, you know, long-suffering, all that stuff, right? Uh, joy. Joy is one of them. Yeah. Anyways, um, oh, it's here. But the fruits of the Spirit are, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All right. Uh, yeah, so those are the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, okay, so I got that here. Fruits of the Spirit. But I say to you, walk in the Spirit, you will not carry out the de desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh sets itself against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. Flesh and Spirit are directly opposite to each other. So that you may not do the things that you please. What does that mean, please? The things you desire. You naturally, you naturally have a taste for these, right? You know, our natural proclivity, our propensity, our tendency, right, is, you know, to, well, you know, immorality, impurity, sensuality, you know, you know, right? 
You know, it's not symbolized by cutting away the foreskin for nothing. Um, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, right? All this is nasty fleshiness, drunkenness, carousing, you know? You know, and, and then everything like, like you know, malicious gossip, lying, whatever, right? Fall, bearing false witness, right? Playing devious games, playing sneaky ass games, right? Um, uh, excuse my French there. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is, okay. Galatians, that's Galatians. Uh, the true Sabbath day of rest, the Sabbathismal. So this is about the true Sabbath day, all right? Uh, the day of rest. So uh, the new covenant is about the, 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 the new Sabbath, the true Sabbath. The only time in the Bible that the word Sabbathismal is used is Hebrews chapter 4, which refers to the eternal Sabbath, right? The eternal day of rest, when God abides within you. For if, so this is what it says in Hebrews 4. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day. Joshua is the precursor of Jesus. Joshua, Joshua is the same as Yeshua, Jesus, right? Both mean Savior. Uh, it's the same name. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. All right, so when you enter into the Sabbath rest, what it means is it doesn't mean you're going to be like, kicking off your shoes, laying on the couch, right? Grabbing a beer and watching the, the ball game, like every day Sunday, right? You know? No, it's the opposite, right? You will do, oh, you, you'll, you'll be energized to do all the good works, but not of your own effort, right? Uh, it's no longer your works, but his works through you, right? And you'd be, you'd be surprised, right, when, when, when you're walking the Spirit of how much energy you have and how easy it is to do good things, right? Why? Because he helps you, right? Uh, yeah, right? And, you know, I, I don't have that now, but I've tasted it once. Uh, he made it easy. All right, so I want to do a comparison between the old covenant of flesh and the new covenant of blood, Right? That Jesus Christ is is commemorating before he before he gives it to us before he's he's crucified. I mean, he's got to, He has to give it. He has to commemorate before he's crucified because afterwards it's too late. Uh, well, he did come back afterwards, but anyways, uh, symbol. So the symbol here was the flesh, the foreskin, right? And that symbolized the fleshly nature, right? And in this case, the symbol is blood, right? So this is coming to flesh, coming to blood. Blood is, you know, uh, considered. The life of the flesh. Okay, that's in uh, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Uh, meaning of symbol, oh, meaning of the symbol, okay. All right, so what the, the flesh here, the, the, the literal flesh foreskin represents our fleshly nature. Our desire for immorality, you know, our desire for anything, anything wicked, right? Uh, and to satisfy ourselves, to be selfish, to be lying, cheating, whatever, you know, whatever, right? To be mean and you know, obnoxious and uh, harmful and you know, uh, so flesh, circumcision, cutting away of our flesh, symbolizing a vow to restrain our fleshly nature, right? Right? Perform. Performed by human hands, right? What it means is this is our our own efforts, our own efforts to suppress our fleshly desires and nature, right? So in this case. The meaning of the symbol here, Christ's blood was a sacrificial blood of the covenant. So what this means is the, 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 the life of the flesh had spilt for the salvation of people. So Christ's blood was the blood spilled you know, right, uh, for the salvation of people, right? So that uh, he was the, the propitiatory payment made in lieu of uh, punishment. All right, but also it instituted the covenant of blood, blood being the life of the flesh, and the true life of the flesh being the Holy Spirit. So it wasn't until Christ was sacrificed and resurrected that 50 days later, which is appropriate because that's you know the number of, of uh, jubilee, right? Which means freedom from bondage, right? Freedom from debt, right? Uh, both of which are applicable in terms of you know 
what happens when you fill the Holy Spirit, right? Bondage to sin, right? Uh, uh, debt, debt of sin, right? That we have to pay for. Uh, okay, anyways, Jesus' propitiatory sacrifice was a payment in lieu of punishment, which allowed for atonement with God, and thus allowing the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which came 50 days later at Pentecost after Christ's resurrection. Right. Okay, circumcision literally of the flesh foreskin. Uh, circumcision here is circumcision in your hearts. Right. Uh, Paul said a true Jew. Uh, this is in Romans 2. He said, you know, he, Paul basically said a Jew is not a person who's circumcised in the flesh. A true Jew is circumcised in the heart. And that was spoken of in Deuteronomy. De Deuteronomy first uh, spoke of that concept of circumcising the hearts. Right. You got to circumcise your heart. Right. Cut away the fleshly nature in your heart. That's what really matters. Not not a piece of skin, literal skin, right? This means nothing. This is this is what it's really all about because this is the real consequences, right, of our heart, and uh, far more than a little piece of skin on your um, um, covenant basis. Covenant upon obeying all the law. Okay, so the basis of the covenant was contingent upon obeying all the laws, right? Well, that worked out great because no one obeyed the laws. You know, everyone violated the law sometime. We all we all sin, right? So this, you know, all right, uh, didn't work, and therefore they required uh, an annual sacrifice, right, uh, as a payment on Yom Kippur to bring atonement to pay for our, pay for our sins, right? Now, so this is contingent upon obeying the law. We have to make the willful effort to obey. This is not contingent upon obeying the law, right? I mean, you should do that, but the first thing required is, right, one, you have faith, okay? John John says, oh, okay, how do you get eternal life? Well, you got to believe in me, right? The only work you got to do, Jesus said, is to believe in me, right? So I believe that, you know, that's how children can be saved, right? It's because of their faith, right? But God's seeking more for that from us. He wants us to be young men, which is about here. This is about being young men, right? But he wants us to seek and love God with all our, to seek God, you know, that's James 4, 8, you know, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Uh, also, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. So this is what he's looking for, right? This is the true obedience, to love God, because this is the great commandment, right? And uh, this is the basis of, the you know, the basis of getting the, the covenant of blood, which is in filling of the Holy Spirit, how God abides within you. Right, so if you love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, my Father will love you, and He and I will make our bold within you. Right, and that's also called for in Deuteronomy chapter six, right, where it says, "What does it say?" It says, you know, "I'll call to you, uh, witness to you this day, right, that you, I set before you life and death, right, uh, that you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength." Uh, motive force, okay, the motive force. So this is the motive force that drives this is an external compulsion, right? You have the written law. You have the law on, on tablets of stone. You have the law written down on paper, parchment, whatever it is, right? And you got to abide by this. And it's an external force that tries to get you to obey internally, right? Obedience to the written law on paper, right? Whereas the motive force in this case is internal reformation through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So this covenant helps you um, so writing the law upon your hearts, which were once made of stone, but now made flesh. All right. So it's totally different. This is external. This is external forcing you, you know, like twisting your arm. This is internal. You're changing inside, making it easy. Once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it, it, you know, he helps you obey the law. All right. I mean, now that's set up here. All this is set up here. Uh, causing you to walk in my statutes, right? Changing your heart here. I'll put my law within them and, and on their hearts. I'll write it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So we said also, you know, you, you know, in filling the Holy Spirit, teaching the law, right? And uh, you know, He'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, right? Effort, effort to obey. Effort to abide. So the effort here is to obey, right? You got to make the effort. Here's the effort is to buy. So you, you, it still requires effort, right? But it's just to draw near to God and to seek and love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? So the idea is not is not to do works, not to do good things, obey the law, so you can get salvation, you go to heaven. The idea is you get heaven first, 
right? Remember we talked about that way back where it's about putting the cart before the horse, right? So the old people say, oh, I got a good, good work so I, I can save myself, get salvation. No, you go and get salvation. You seek God. God is salvation. God is eternal life. God is, you know, he, you know, he, he is the source of goodness. So you get God first, and then out of you will, 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 will come good works naturally, not of your effort, but it'll be easy. Right? So, you know, easy or hard. Uh, well, one is you don't remember all the laws, right? You don't keep them all in the, in the foremost in your mind, right? And a lot of times you willfully ignore them. I know I, know I do, right? You know, because I want to please myself, right? Uh, so, it's, you know, we fail here. Sometimes we're good. Sometimes we fail, right? You know, I don't, I, I, if anyone says I don't sin, well, you know they're, they're either a liar, or a liar or totally delusional, right? Uh, Holy Spirit is a helper, parakletos, right? Which means he's a legal counselor or advisor whom Jesus will, said will teach us all things and bring them to remembrance, right? In other words, the Holy Spirit will help us to be good. We don't have to try, Right, and it's just like what it says, you know, as far as far as the the Sabbatismos, right, right. There will come a day when you'll cease from your own works, just as God sees from His, right. He created the world in six days, but on the seventh day He rested. So we will reach our seventh day, which is our day of perfection, and that day of perfection, fulfillment, completion, right, which is represented by the number seven, right. That that day of perfection is a day that. Uh, God operates through us, and it's His work, His working through us. It's no longer our works, right? And therefore, He makes it easy. It's no effort. It just pours out of us without trying. Uh, but the, the only try is to abide in Him, to seek and love Him, you know, with all your heart, to the point where then He, you know, I don't know why or when He He He, he decided to fill me with His Spirit, but I remember exactly when it happened, right? And I know it was like the weirdest thing. It wasn't natural. Um, you know, it's just like Nicodemus in John chapter 3 where it's like a wind. You don't know where it comes from, and it was. It was a wind, not outside me, you know, hitting my skin, but inside me. I was like, what? That, well, that was weird, right? Where, you know, and I was like, oh, whatever. You know, I didn't think anything of it, but then from then on, I was different. You know, I mean, you're like, well, whatever, you know, okay. Uh, perfectly, uh, so if... Whether it's effective or not, this is ineffective. This never worked. The old covenant never worked. Why? Because it was dependent upon people obeying the law, and no one obeyed the law. We all broke the law. We all sinned, right? This is perfectly effective because to the extent you're, you're walking in the Spirit, right? Man, he helps you to be good. But now, uh, um, Paul says other things. Okay, well, here, so I'm, uh, this is Roman. So, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, this is the law here, God did, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And so he made him sin, who knew no sin, right? And, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Yeah, so if you're walking in the spirit, man, he helps you be good. Right, because he's the legal counselor. He's the Paracletos, right? And he, he just helps you, you know, who brings all things to remembrance. Why? Because he just helps you be good. You know, it's it's God's spirit that leads you. Uh, for we know that the law is spiritual, uh, but I am of flesh, sold in bondage to sin. All right, and God frees us from bondage to sin on Pentecost, which is the day of jubilee which is the day of liberation from bondage, slaves set free, right? All right? That's why it's so appropriate that that uh, Pentecost came 50 days after Christ's resurrection because that number 50 represents Jubilee. And Jubilee is a, day, is a year of freedom from bondage, freedom from debt, right? So we're in debt to sin. Our sin is our debt. Just like the, the guy who owned 10,000 talents, right? right? Requires that we be punished, right? Bondage. We're in bondage to sin. We're slaves to sin. Why? Because flesh is our, na our, our natural nature, right? To be fleshly. We want to, we want to please ourselves, right? Instead of pleasing God. That's just the way we're wired, right? Everyone's like that. Uh, for what am I doing? I did not do. Okay, this is what Paul says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I'm not practicing, what I would like to do, but I but I am doing the very thing I hate. 
right? So he's like, man, you know, I know I should be doing this, but I'm doing it. I know I, 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 I should be doing this, but I'm not doing this. Right, so the new covenant of blood fill, fulfills or perfects the old covenant of the flesh. All right, Jesus says, do not think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Right, we learned about that in, in Matthew chapter 5. Right, and you know, talk about the Sabbath. You know, in the old covenant, uh, there was no rest, really. It was our work, our effort, our struggle, right, which we f fail all the time to keep all the law. Right, and the Sabbath was the symbolic, you know, literal one day in seven. Now, with the new covenant, the, uh, the, 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 the Sabbath is now the Sabbatismos, which is the, the eternal day of rest when, when God's Spirit abides within you, right? And it's no longer your works, but Him working through you. Our perfect rest, not our works, but God working through us, okay? Heaven, arenos. It's a, you know, in the old covenant, heaven is like, oh, this is a state, or, you know, I want to I wanna be in, you know, in the future after we, after we die, right? Whereas, you know, in the New Covenant, heaven is in our hearts right now. It's, you know, when God abides in our heart, God is eternal life. So, you know, we can have that eternal life, which is God's perfect goodness in our hearts right now. So heaven is in our hearts to the extent God abides within us. Right? It's also the kingdom, right? The kingdom, is, you know, is where, 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 where the king's law rules. Well, you know, why is the king law rule when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Because... That's how the, the law is written upon your heart. So it establishes the kingdom of God in your heart because that's where the law is written. That's where the, you abide by the law. That's where the jurisdiction of the law, where the law has power and effect. It's, in, it's in within your heart. Uh, temple. It's a literal temple made of stone and mortar, you know, so that the, uh, the Jews are like, oh, you know, he said he's going he's gonna to break down the temple. Well, they're thinking of the literal temple. Jesus Christ is saying, no, our bodies are... We are meant to be the temples. We are the temples in which God's spirit is to abide, right? And that's what Paul was saying. That listen, don't do anything wicked, don't do any craftiness, because you're going to destroy the temple. And who does it? You do, right? When you do wickedness, uh, we do, right? State state of our hearts. So this old covenant did it all. Change our hearts. We're still our nasty, selfish, fleshly, soulful selves who want to do wicked, and we uh, do all, our, all we can to try to suppress that, but then oftentimes we don't even bother. We just do what we want, right? So we violate the law, right? We sin. does not change us. We're still our nasty selves, which we try to suppress somewhat, you know? Uh, you know, I'm no better than anyone, you know? Uh, transforms our hearts, gives us a new heart, giving us a, give, giving us a goodness that we're not capable of, right? So... Uh, this changes our hearts. This doesn't change our hearts. We're still our nasty selves. God gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh, right? Uh, okay, um, let's try to finish this up here. Okay, uh, and after singing the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Okay, so this is a quote actually of Zechariah 13. We talked about Zechariah 11, right? The potter's field and, you know, 30 pieces of shekels of silver, right? right? But this is 13. Uh, and this is the quote, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man my associate declares the war to host. Uh, strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Okay, so... Uh, so, uh, and that's exactly what happened after Jesus Christ was crucified. You know? Uh, even after he was arrested, they scattered. Right? Uh, so, yeah, well, uh, you, you know, yeah, I say here, after he's crucified, but even after he was arrested, they scattered. His disciples fled in fear, even after he arose from the dead, Right? So he rose from the dead and spent 40 days with them. And, they're, and then after that, they, they, they retreated to within the upper room. And, and they're, they're fearful. Right? Until Pentecost came, 50 days after Christ's resurrection, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. And the disciples then went out boldly to preach the gospel you know, with, with uh, the threat of death being waved in front of their face. Right? And all of them would be martyred. All of them would be killed. Peter crucified upside down. All but John would be martyred, and John would write Revelations, right? Uh, and recall what the Pharisee G G Gamaliel said. So Gamaliel was Paul's uh, 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 rabbi, 
teacher, right? And he was one of the few, you know, really godly uh, 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 Pharisees, you know. Uh, a lot of these Pharisees were bad. They're just totally worldly, right? They're about money and... Um, anyways, uh, but Gamal, he was a good guy. Um, but when they heard this, they were, they were cut to the quick. Okay, these are the Pharisees, you know, and tend to kill them. The, these are the disciples, right? Right? They wanted to kill the disciples. But Pharisee named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, he was actually Paul's teacher, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men aside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care that you uh, care what you propose to do these men. For some time ago, Thutius uh, rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined with him. And, but he was killed, and all the followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After this, another guy, uh, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of, of the census and drew away uh, some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay from these men, let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may be found fighting against God. Okay? All right. Uh, now, what happened to Christianity? Christianity grew, grew you know. So, so the leaders here, the, the leaders are killed off, and the whole movement dies, right? The leader here, Jesus Christ, is killed off, and it grows to be the largest religion in the whole world, where one-third of the world's population is Christian. Right? No other religion bigger than that. Right, uh, you know, and, and you know, you, you can say whatever, but I see God's hand in that. Right, the leader dies. Right, all the disciples, all the chief proponents die. Right, and then it grows to be the biggest religion in the world. Um, you know, all the disciples died except for John. But Peter answered and said to him, Even though all may fall away before you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if uh, I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Right? So, he, you know, Jesus, Peter's saying this, probably, why? Because, he, I don't know, he, maybe he truly believes it, but he doesn't really understand the weakness of the flesh. So this is about weakness of the flesh. What is the weakness of flesh? What is one of, there's many weaknesses of the flesh. One is cowardly, self-protecting, self-serving, you know, self-defending. Uh, and I'm, I'm guilty of self-defending. I, I don't like being, you know, falsely accused or whatever, you know. And, you know, uh, and, and, and Oswald Chambers says, you know, you, can't, you shouldn't defend yourself. You should just, just leave it to God. Let, let, let it all fall out before God, right? Because, you know, when you, when you defend yourself, um, you're showing, one, it's all about yourself, but two, it's showing lack of faith and trust in God. So that's what Oswald Chambers says. It's not easy to do. Uh, okay. Uh, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee. Uh, that was James and John, right? Sons of Zebedee. And began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deep, deeply grieved <coughs> to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. All right? Okay, so I guess the only thing I want to talk about this is um, uh, the, the word Gethsemane means I'll oppress. You know, oppress for extracting oil. All right? And it's appropriate here. You know, it's symbolic, but it's appropriate because, you know, uh, uh, this is a place where, where Jesus Christ's soul was so squeezed at the point of death. I mean, he, he was in anguish here, you know, psychologically, knowing what he's going to have to go through. He knows all the torture, you know, and, and, and then the horrible death, you know, uh, he's going to have to go through with, with people mocking him. Uh, he, so he's anguished, right, about his impending torture and crucifixion. Uh, so, so anguished that he, he, he sweat great drops like blood. Right, Luke uh, 22, 44, right? Uh, and so he was anguished. Uh, so, so anguished was Jesus. That was like his life was being squeezed out of him, right? Life, you know, the, the, the blood being the life of the flesh, right? Recall that Jesus was fully God, but also fully man, with all the weaknesses of, of flesh, right? He, he, he had the weakness, the self-preserving weakness, just like we have. But who yet did not sin, right? He obeyed God, even unto death. Where did it say that? That's in the Bible somewhere. That's uh, in the New Testament somewhere. That Jesus Christ obeyed God even unto death. Uh, John 
Um, you know, I'm going to look it up real quick. Let's see death. Oh, Philippians 2.8. Philippians 2.8. Okay, I'm going to write that down here. Okay. Jesus obeyed God even unto death. That's Philippians 2, 8. Okay, and and uh, so yeah, he's my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. So he he's so grieved, he, he, he feels like he's dying, right? And you can imagine what he's going through. Well, it's hard to imagine what he's going through. It's so bad, right? Uh, uh, extracting the oil, okay. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face. So he so greedy he fell on his face, saying, "Father, if possible, if it's possible, let let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as Thou will." Remember, I said that this chapter is about sacrifice. Here's where he sacrificed. He sacrificed his soul right here, right. He made the commitment to obey God, right. He he sacrificed his self, right. He chose to sacrifice right here. Um, this is the first time Jesus chose God's will above his own here. I'm not going to say that's wrong. Uh, uh, not the first time he did it. I, I, I said that wrong. Um, this is where Jesus sacrificed his self. Right. Not as I will, but as thou will. The self is the self wants to make itself ascendant. My will, what I want. Um, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and said to them, "You men cannot keep watch with me one hour. I keep watching and pray that you may not enter into temptation." Into temptation. So, what is tempted? The flesh. Right. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so, uh, flesh is weak. The f fear, um, self-preservation, saving self. All right. This is our natural instinct. Ah, uh, the flesh re represents all the nasty things in human nature: greed, dishonesty, villainy, envy, jealousy, hurtfulness, meanness, lying, deceiving, cheating, mocking, blah blah blah. All that stuff. All the nastiness. All right. Uh, people do it in little ways and in big ways, right? You know, and we put it on our mind, you know. I don't do those things. Okay, yeah, sure. And the flesh is weak because we are wired from birth to feed it. God gave us free will, which wants, above all things, to please itself, right? And because the flesh is weak, we all sin, even though we, we may know better. You know, I, I know better, but I, <coughs> just like Paul said, you know, what I want to do, I don't do. What, what, I, what, what I know I, sh I, I shouldn't do, I do. <coughs> <coughs> our only hope for salvation is Christ's payment for our sins, right? Uh, but he wants more than that. He wants us. <coughs> he wants salvation for us, not after we die, but right now, <coughs> through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> who writes God's law upon our hearts, <coughs> freeing us from, from our fleshly nature, our sin nature, and still <coughs> instilling within us a purity and goodness. <coughs> that is not of this world. <coughs> oh man! <coughs> and Jesus' propitiatory sacrifice allowed for the atonement with God, making the atonement <coughs> with the Holy Spirit possible. So His sacrifice made this possible, giving us the Holy Spirit, which came at Pentecost. <coughs> All right, so. He wants this for us. You know, he, he, his sacrifice paid for his sin, so, but he wants us to, to have salvation, not after we die. Go to, so, we, you know, you die and go to heaven. He wants to have salvation. He wants heaven in your heart now, right, before you die. <clears throat> and that will make you good. That will help you obey the law. That will help you not sin. Um, so here he says it again, you know, uh, you know, my father, uh, this cannot pass unless I drink it. You know, thy will be done. Right, so he makes the decision to sacrifice here again, and again he came and found them 
sleeping for their eyes were heavy and he let, he left them again and went away and play, prayed a third time right saying the same thing so he's a third time he says okay god you know please take this away from me but you know not my will your will he's gonna do it you know uh three times he, he, he He's pleading not that he doesn't have to go through this, but he's, he's saying, well, I'll do it, right? Um, you know, he's anguished to death. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping, taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of uh, sinners. <clears throat> All right. So this is where Judas comes along when he's, he's pulling these people, and this is where the Pharisees and you know, chief priests try to, you know, corner Jesus Christ. All right, arise, let us be going. Behold, one, the one who betrays me is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, he was being betrayed by uh, he who was betraying him. Uh, well, he gave a sign, all right? So what do, what do I want to say here? The sign was a kiss, right? Kiss of death, right? Uh... So Jesus says, you know what, you know, you think you're doing this, but this is, this is that God's uh, 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 will it, it takes place, that the scriptures be fulfilled, right? Uh, disciples left him and fled. Why? Because the flesh is weak. They're afraid. Uh, and those who see Jesus led him away uh, to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the, is the high priest. One priest a year is elected, selected to be the high priest. He's a top dog for that year, right? It's Caiaphas this year. Gathered together, all right? And they start questioning him, right? right? And you can see Jesus doesn't say anything outright, right? Uh, he says, okay, hey, did you say, okay, did you, you said that, you know, destroy the temple. You need an answer, right? You know, he said, you say you can destroy the temple and build it up in three days. And Jesus kept silent, right? They said, yeah, you say you're the Son of God. And he doesn't really answer. He says, but you, you, you've said it yourself, right? And then they're like, oh, blasphemy. You know what blasphemy is? Blasphemy is saying anything bad against God, right? So from their perspective, was he really blaspheming God or was he blaspheming their sensibilities, Right, we, we, you know. Anyways, I think they're more like upset with what he's saying, and that is it wasn't really about God being upset. Like they're thinking. Um. So uh, let's see here. So they're trying to ask him questions to get to, to get some uh, get something on him, All right? And uh, Peter here, Peter. So this this last section is about Peter. Uh, 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 denying, you know, saying, doing exactly what Jesus Christ said he would do. He'll, he'll deny him three times before the cock crows, right? Uh, cock crowed here, right? After the third time he denied Jesus Christ. All right, so let me give you a little insight into the next chapter. So right, right now, the the Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, they see Jesus Christ as a threat, threat to their system, to their their their, their power structure, right? They want to get rid of him, right? And uh, so they're looking. They're looking to find some angle which they can they can accuse him of something, right? And you'll see that they bring this before Pilate. Why did they bring it before Pilate? Because they feared. They feared for their own lives. They were cowards. They didn't want to execute Jesus Christ themselves. Were actually it was fully within the law, within the nomos that they the punishment for blasphemy. If they accused him of that, and you know. You know, and they have the stuff on him for blasphemy. They could kill him. That was in, uh, I forget where it was, but that was in the Nomos. That's in the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books of the Bible somewhere. Uh, I think it's Leviticus. <clears throat> Anyways, if you blasphemy God, the, the penalty for that is death. So they, they have the, the, the legal right on their own to kill Jesus Christ, but you know, they didn't want to, right? Because they're afraid for their lives. So what do they do? They try to get Rome to do it, right? They're cowards. So let's get Rome to do it. So then they bring the issue before uh, Pilate, and he says, oh, he's saying, you know, he's the son of God, right? He's, he's a disturbance, right? Right? But, and he's like, no, that's your, that's your religious, Pilate's like, that's your religious matter. You you take care of that. Nothing to do with me, right? So then they go back and like, oh, man, how, how do we make this an issue for Pilate? 
So then they bring the thing, oh, he said he's the king of the Jews, right? And uh, um, now, if he says he's king of the Jews, then Pilate has to do something about that because that is a threat to political authority. That is a, a threat to political stability, you know? And if Pilate, if there's any instability within his territory, then, he, you know, the hammer comes down on him from, from Caesar, right? Or whoever was uh, the, 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 the emperor at the time. Um, so he's got to do something about it. So they, they wormed it. They finagled it to make it an issue that Pilate has to deal with, right? Uh, but then Pilate is worming his way out of it, right? So he, Pilate's like, oh, man, I don't want to do this, but, you know. And then so, you know, he asked Jesus Christ, uh, we'll see in the next chapter, that, hey, they say you're king of the Jews. Is that true? And Jesus, you know, uh, says, yeah, you know, it is what you say, right? But he says, um, in the book of John, anyways, he says, uh, but, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, then my boys would be out in the street fighting for me, right? But it's not, right? His, his kingdom is not of the world. His kingdom is the Basilia, right? which is the kingdom of God, as it is established within the hearts of men, right? Changing their hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so then Pilate's like, oh, man, I still got nothing on this guy, right? So then he's like, Pilate worms his way out of it by saying, oh, I'll throw it back in your court, right? So you got this tradition where you can free one guy, you know. Uh, who do you choose, right? And they all say, Barabbas, right? Free Barabbas. You want, uh, Barabbas or Jesus? They have free Barabbas. Who was Barabbas? He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. He was the type of Messiah they were hoping for, right? What was the, what was the Jewish Messiah? He would be a leader, right? He would be... A political leader, a military leader, and he would overthrow, you know, uh, Roman Roman hegemony, right? Roman Ro Roman Roman totalitarian, you know, uh, oppression, and so forth, and and uh, and so they, they want to free Barabbas, you know, a murderer instead of Jesus Christ, and you know. So they're all playing games. Pilate's playing games. The Jewish, you know, they're like, they're all trying to be worms. Uh, that's it for this chapter. Okay, so let's, uh, the key thing is Jesus Christ sacrificed. And the sacrifice uh, made possible the, the incoming of the new covenant, which is perfects the law, which the law couldn't, couldn't you know, Paul says what the law cannot do, right? Right? You, you know, the new covenant does by making it possible, by writing the law upon our hearts. By filling us with the Holy Spirit, making it easy, giving us the helper. But this is contingent upon our loving God with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strengths. So this is the key thing here. And Jesus Christ made this possible by his sacrifice, which allowed for atonement with God, which allowed for the coming of the, the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's it.